Hey guys, I just wanted to do my review for X-Men Apocalypse, directed by Brian Singer and starring Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, Nicholas Holt, and among and Olivia Munn, among others, and and Oscar Isaac as the title character. So basically, this takes place in 1983, exactly 10 years after. Um, the events of Days of Future Past, and I guess it's hinted around, maybe, I think it's supposed to be maybe the anniversary, or I guess, of Magneto's attempt to assassinate President Nixon in Boulevard Trask, and Mystique su successfully stopping him, and it starts off with a flashback to 36,000 BC, um, and basically... Apocalypse has this ability to transfer his consciousness from one body to the next, and they don't hit that it's because of, of like the alien technology, just because I guess the Celestials are, they're kind of like with the Maximoff twins, where it's like, it's kind of like icky legal territory as to, you know, how much they can, how much they can reference, which, how much each studio can reference one to the other. And of course, the Egyptians trap him, destroy his pyramid, and trap him, but and trap him, you know, beneath the rubble to prevent him from further ruling over Egypt and being a threat. But then, of course, he's accidentally reawakened in modern times and feels like because the world is lost without his rule, that he has to step in and recruit the his four horsemen, which includes Magneto, um, Storm, who the first of his recruits, who he finds in. Cario as a pickpocket, and also Psylocke and Archangel, who, even though Mystique rescues Nightcrawler after they're both after he's forced into a cage fight with An Archangel, um, Apocalypse is the one who recruits Archangel to, um, I guess, as part of his four horsemen. And of course, um, Xavier's successfully reopen. The Institute, he has like a higher, they're like, it gives a higher enrollment rate just because people find out about mutants far, you know, decades earlier than the original timeline. But then, of course, Mystique asked for his aid in helping finding Magneto and also finding Magneto because he's re emerged and Apocalypse kidnaps um, Charles Xavier and Mystique is is forced into a situation where he has to leave the X-Men to rescue him and stop Apocalypse's plans to remake the world in his image. Now, this movie has apparently a 49% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's even lower than X-Men The Last Stand, which is shocking to me. And I just figured... I decided to just ignore the criticisms personally and went into this movie with an open mind because I figured that... this. Captain America Civil War set the bar so high for them, it just seems like based on our review, they were just kind of like tired of the whole, um, you know, meet, you know, bad guy trying to take over the world scenario, and, and, I don't know what, I think it was a little bit underrated by the critics, it's based on the tomato score, to be perfectly honest, because I like this movie a lot. It's a, not quite as good as First Class or Days of Future Past as far as this new trilogy, but I enjoyed the hell. I mean, I enjoyed this movie a lot. I liked how they introduced the younger version of the characters like Cyclops and Jean Grey and Nightcrawler, all their respective actors did a fantastic job in their roles. I liked how they made um, Scott a little bit more of like a rub, a little bit more of the rebel. Um, more like, I guess, the quote-unquote bad boy. He was the one telling people, you know, to cut school. And the scene where his power is, like, and he was kind of a smart-ass. Smart and the scene where he kind of used his powers to, um... Where his powers, like, first started to emerge when he was at school. And, you know, Jean Grey being the one who just kind of just didn't want to deal with his bullshit. But they kind of, like, developed a friendship. And it wasn't just, you know... Jean Grey just being the object of affections for between Cyclops and Wolverine, or Cyclops just being there like, oh, he's just the leader, and that's basically his, his, some of his characterization. And and basically, and I guess the thing is, I guess the 
one complaint they didn't understand about the critics is that it focused more about the dynamic between the new characters and also I guess those three characters more than as and also bring Quicksilver into a mix. He did play a much bigger role in this, especially since um, he he talked about how his dad was. He learned how his father was Magneto, and he wanted to. He joined the X Men as a way of trying to um, reveal that to Magneto and I guess reconnect with him. And I guess that's the thing about the. I guess that's the really thing. The thing. The complaint they had about it is that. I guess they have the more the biggest character focus as opposed to like some of the other characters. I mean, there was the kind of there was a dynamic between um, Fassbender and James McAvoy about Charles trying to convince Eric not to join the Horsemen, and there's a little bit of um, the dynamic between Mystique in which she's her arc is that basically is that she's still retaining her human form i mean aside from the fact that you know hey jennifer lawrence is an oscar winner so they want her give her as much screen time without makeup as possible she doesn't she doesn't see herself as a hero because of the fact that she sees herself as a hero because she didn't she hasn't been able to see as many lives as she would like to and also because she realizes that unlike charles who's just been at the school and just sees everybody you know, getting along peacefully he's been kind of Naive to the fact that unlike Raven, he's seen that there's still like hostility between man mutants, and even though they have there hasn't led to been like a, a quote unquote war between um, the two races, and that and that's kind of and it's because um, they basically come to like, an understanding, and they basically have to. It's basically about them trying to like understand each other's points of view throughout the movie and. It basically the reason why she has to step up and take out and lead the team throughout this whole adventure and um, I can't get into too much without too much else without spoiling it so I'm just gonna warn you now this will be that the from now on this is gonna be the spoiler portion of the review I'll let you know when I'll put an annotation so you can jump ahead to the end of the video and and you know in case you haven't seen the movie yet, and, or if you want to just and want to just go see it and come back to it afterwards, so basically, like it's so after Mora sadly is the one who ends up accidentally um, waking up Apocalypse because she follows these cult followers of Apocalypse into this cave, and because you know this part of the pyramid that was collapsed upon. Apocalypse was um, it was basic. It basically required sunlight to wake him up. It's because she, you know, opened the door to, down to the crep, opened the door down to the crevice. It's the reason why he was reawakened and killed his other followers, and why she barely made it out alive. And his awa his awakening causes like an earthquake, like not just in Cario, but around the entire planet, and. Even in and even in Poland, where Magneto has settled down with a wife, wife and wife who named Magna, and they have a daughter named Nina. He's told her who he, she, Magneto has told her er, has told her about his past and who and who he was, and she's accepted him for who he is because he's basically he's said, you know settled down, have a domestic life where he's working at this factory and. You know, live in the woods, live in peace, away from all the, and away from all, away from all the hostility between man mutants. But the earthquake causes one of this like um, I don't know what it's called. I guess like one of these containers that's full of molten metal to almost fall on one of his coworkers, and he's forced to use his powers to save his life to move it out of the way. But because everybody saw what he did. He basically tells his family to pack up and leave, and then he finds out the authorities have taken his daughter, and they want to take him into custody not just because of he's just for being a mutant, but because they recognize him from, you know, newspaper from from the news, and that he was the one responsible for trying to kill Nixon, and so he and so he agrees to turn himself over to turn himself over to the authorities quietly as long as they leave his family alone, but. His nine-year-old daughter is just freaking out, and she's just like, and apparently she has the power to, I guess, like control animals. I think it's kind of, 
or is like like she has like birds like flying around at the policeman and they're like startled by it and one of the policemen accidentally releases a bow and arrow and that kills both Nina and Magna at the same time and Magneto breaks down and the locket of Magneto's parents that he gave to his daughter he uses that to basically slit the throats of all the policemen even though they both like horrified at what they just did and remorseful he basically just slits their throats with the locket and then he like shouts to this guy is this what you want for me is this what you wanted me to be and then he goes to the back to the factory and because of the fact that he's angry that that they turned him over to the authorities and this is kind of this like black comedy moment to where Apocalypse teleports in with the other three horsemen he's recruited and he turns around and goes who the fuck are you and then it's like don't ru and he's basically this whole like don't ruin this moment for me don't stop me from killing these men and basically Apocalypse uses his um, matter manipulation powers to basically have them all sink to the ground and die like instantly and just tell Magneto he he's there for him and of course um like I said, after Mystique rescues um, Nightcrawler and tries to get him, and tries to get him, and tries to get him passage to the United States through, I guess, Caravan or Carbon. Um, he just and she's the he's the one who tells them he's the one who tells them about Magneto resurfacing, and she takes Nightcrawler to the X Mansion. They meet up with, you know, he. They meet up with Hank and saying that I guess neither one of us are blue. And then of course it interjects with Nightcrawler awkwardly going, "Hey, I'm still blue." When they're just having this like nice kind of romantic moment and sort of like you can tell that they're still, at least you can tell like B still has feelings for her. And he goes to talk to. Char they have this. There's a little bit of tension between him and Charles because he's saying just because it's a. W is saying how this is because there's not a war doesn't mean there's peace. You want to teach your kids anything, teach them how to fight and st uh, how to fight. And she's a he becomes upset about her still sounding like Eric. And that's when she mentions that he's resurfaced. He uses Cerebro to find him and finds out that what happened to his family, his wife and daughter. And he learns about apocalypse. And that's when he learns through the telepathic link between Magneto and Charles that he decides to take over. He takes over um, Charles Charles's body and tries to and tries to send a message. I guess tries to send a message to the rest of the world, that, or at least uses him to take control of soldiers who have access to all the nuclear missiles around the world. And you think in the trailers this was supposed to be his way of trying to destroy the planet, but he ends up launching them all into space and disarming the entire world's nuclear missiles. Basically, so he basically so, so they don't have a means of stopping him. And of course, Havoc is there, who brings um, his younger brother Cyclops there to um, help control his powers. And there's this funny moment where he ends up using his his optic blast to destroy a tree of Charles that was like a child is from childhood, a family heirloom. And then Havoc has to use his abilities to. As Charles says, wreak havoc and destroy Cerebro, so Apocalypse can't use Cerebro for his own ends. But then he ends up, but then Apocalypse and the Four Horsemen ends up showing up the X Mansion anyway, and they kidnap Charles Xavier, and Havoc tries to stop him from teleporting away, but he ends up blowing up a generator, and that's when, of course, Quicksilver shows up, and they have, he has a similar sequence here they did in Days of Future Past, where he's basically trying to save a bunch of lives. I don't know if I say what quite tops it, quite tops the first time I seen in the last movie, just because the novelty's not there and he knew it was coming. But it has a pretty funny scene where it's he basically just like he basically drinks a can of tab and just leaves it in midair. He tries to rescue a dog. He takes moves all the pizza before he actually rescues the dog who has who had the last slice. He keeps blowing because I'm more McTaggart and he was there at the mansion too. Because they figured, um, because because they figured, um, Charles found out through Cerebro that what ha what happened in Egypt, and they go to find out what she knew about Apocalypse and her research. 
and there's this moment where he sees this guy about to like open mouth kiss another girl and he's grossed out by it so he sends them flying and it's just a like, really funny scene you kind of have to see to believe and he basically gets everybody out saints for havoc who he's basically was too closest to the blast and so he's already killed before like the entire X mansion blows up and but then of course the whole but then of course um we have a rescue team who's basically going to take care of the kids and apparent but Mystique freaks out when it turns out they're being led by William Stryker and so he takes captive Mystique and Beast and Quicksilver to Alkali Lake and Jean using her telekinesis using her telepathy to basically make it look like they're hidden he she Cyclops and Nightcrawler um, sneak aboard a helicopter to try to rescue them and, but in order to cause a diversion she has to release Wolverine and basically go on his finally go on like his berserker rampage that they keep hyping up in the other movies but we finally get to close the seeing in this film or the closest thing to seeing a berserker rage in live action because this you know for a PG-13 movie they really like push the violence in it because they have like people getting decapitated and by apocalypse and then of course in this this whole scene where you know Wolverine after being freed from a cage and wearing this like helmet but where Stryker like brainwashed him and repressed erased all of his memories in homage to the Weapon X comic book he basically goes on this rampage like slaughtering every soldier in his path throughout the um, Alkali Lake facility you know there's blood splattering everywhere like they don't like sugarcoat this at all like you'd be kind of I mean you it's almost as like you'd be kind of surprised that you kind of surprised as it still managed to get a PG-13 rating after seeing this scene and it basically buys them enough time for Cyclops to use his optic blast to free Mystique and company from the power dampening prison and before Wolverine leaves that she uses her powers to help him regain at least some of his memories before running out into the wilderness and Cyclops makes a joke saying well holy shit I hope we don't ever see that guy ever again and so they take off and they get um, flight suits and take off in a jet from Alkali Lake to Egypt as based on a message telepathically sent by Charles Xavier to Jean Grey and turns out Apocalypse wants to transfer his consciousness into Charles Xavier so he'll be able to use his telepathy to um, amplify that and also take control of every person's mind on the planet which I guess there's like another criticism they had about people saying that it, it felt like it was more of the same so it felt a little bit similar to well it's not really similar basically a villain using um no it's not really similar it's i mean he there he's being used to, his powers are being used to take control of other people's minds not as a way of trying to like kill people on the planet but and it's and the ritual is what causes um charles to go bald and but basically they but basically they arrive um there's they get um, Charles Xavier to safety, but there's this whole battle between, you know, the X-Men and the Four Horsemen. And this is the thing kind of, like, disappointing about it was because I really thought, you know, Psylocke was just going to be using a katana, and the trailers may look like, oh, she just uses, like, her power, her abilities to just, like, make the katana blade, like, light up, like, in the, light up purple or something like that. But no, she actually does have, like, psychonic blade. She uses it that she... She used like a katana blade on one one hand and then the psionic blade that she produces with her own abilities. And I was happy about that. And but Archangel probably gets even less characterization in this movie than he did in X-Men the Last Stand, if that's possible. I mean these two basically don't get that much more characterization from bit uh what is it? From X Men: The Last Stand have been looking more comic book accurate as far as appearance. They're just basically just the muscle, and of course, Archangel is killed in battle, and Sala just decides, you know, you know, screw it, I'm out of here, just to cut her losses and leaves. 
And then, of course, there's a really cool moment where... Um, Quicksilver's just, like, staring at Apocalypse, and all of a sudden he just starts punching him around like a rag doll. But then, until Apocalypse is able to slow his perception and stop him and break his leg, and he's about to... And the fact that he's about to kill, almost kill, choke Mystique to death, and who's, who, of course, is looked at the, as a as um as a hero by the entire mutant community, including Storm, and also what causes her to turn against Apocalypse, and the fact that um Magneto, whose powers have been amped up thanks to Apocalypse, to the point where she can not manipulate all kinds of metal, but also manipulate magnetic like the Earth's magnetic field, and also like organic metals, like in the comic books. Like, his power levels are just, like, on par with his comic book counterpart at this point and create magnetic force fields, and, Ra you know, Raven tries to remind him that, you know, he's, there's still, even though he's lost his family, he still has people he cares about, and the thing that was kind of disappointing was that Quicksilver just copped out of, you know, telling Magneto that um, he, was, he was his father and just says, oh, I fight for family too. And... At first, I got this kind of vague look on his face that maybe he, he he has a hint that maybe this kid could be his son. Or, but then it has like flashbacks to first class of his like happier moments with um, Charles Xavier, and there's this tear down his cheek, and then he gets these two um um not like these two metal poles to stop Apocalypse from trying to kill the rest of the X Men. When Apocalypse says, you betrayed me, and Magneto says, no, I betrayed them. And then tries to throw as much metal at Apocalypse and then pale him as much as he can, but he's still trying to, like, block, I guess, with his telekinesis, and Cyclops is still firing on him, and Storm is still trying to use his powers to keep him from teleporting away, and... And then, of course, at the same time, he's having this, like, telekinetic battle with Charles Xavier in his... In Charles's mind, thanks to the telepathic link that they shared, it's basically was in the trailer where um, he still had it was inside the X Mansion. He grew giant size and was like smacking um, Charles Xavier around like a rag doll and nearly beats him to death in the telepathic battle. But then he tells Apocalypse that he, the problem is that he's alone, but he's not. He's able to call out the Jean Grey to not only help him stop Apocalypse telekinetically in their, you know astral plane mind battle but he encourages her to unleash the full pa power of the phoenix force to basically disintegrate and kill apocalypse and save the world and it was also like a nice little character development for him because like you can tell like he still remembers um the memories from from wolverine about what happened to gene in the future and learns that you know he can't control the women in his life like he did with mystique and he can't do the same thing with gene so instead of like trying to like lock away the Phoenix, he teaches her how to control and embrace it and an ironic turn of events, the Phoenix ends up saving his life rather than killing him like it like in the original timeline. And then ironically it seems like Magneto is like forgiven for his actions in spite of the fact that he basically killed millions of people in this movie. Since it was since of, since they're not trying to take him to cut nobody's trying to take him to custody for his help in trying to save kill Apocalypse. And he decides, you know, not to tell... And I guess Quicksilver, like I said, decides not to tell Magneto that he's his dad, I guess because, like, he feels like... I guess Quicksilver feels like, you know, Magneto's never going to accept him because like, he loved, he had his family who was just mourning and he still cared for. and But he decides to stick around with the X-Men just because of, like, the, because of, like, the fatherly nature and concern that Charles had towards him during the fight. And... It turns out, in spite of the event, it turns out in surpri what surprised me, and I thought didn't think what happened was, it seemed like there was a reconciliation, presumably not between not just between Raven and Charles, but also bet between Charles and Magneto. So apparently, I guess he's not exactly a good guy, but apparently he's not going to like try to take over the. Not apparently going to be a bad guy who wants mutant supremacy, and I guess maybe, and he turns down Charles's offer to stay to stay on as a teacher. So, maybe in future films, he's going to be more of, like, they take on the more anti-hero role that he's done in, like, the current comics post, um, Avengers vs. 
I guess in like you know more recent comics. As this cool moment where, you know, Mystique, you know, finally you know staying in her blue form, is teaching the is teaching the new, the new kids like you're not just students anymore. You're X Men. Forget everything you're learning, and you realize they're in the danger room, that Virtuous Simulator being, getting ready to fight um 1970s era Sentinels and. And it has this last steely look from Charles Xavier saying that he's become more of a badass and now he's ready to, um, like he tells Magneto, he pities the poor soul who's going to, going to, who comes to his school looking for trouble. Like the lines, but the last lines between them are almost like verbatim from the ends of X-Men 1. So, overall, like I said, not everybody got their moment to shine, which is, you know... Even though it was less egregious in Days of Future Past, I mean, this has always been a problem with, you know, these X-Men movies, and this is like a double-edged sword about having Brian Singer as part of these movies. It's just like, there's some characters we'll focus on just because they're in the original trilogy, and then others they're just fine as kind of, like, disposable, which is disappointing, but overall, I enjoy the hell out of this movie. I actually might go see this again, and I just recommend it for anybody who's an X-Men fan or or is definitely better than Batman v Superman for sure. And like I said, I'd rewatch this again and not quite as good as um I guess like days of, you know, first class days of future past. Um but definitely not as bad as like Last Stand or X-Men Origins Wolverine. So are you guys still still want to go see this movie? If you have seen this movie, leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you like this video, like, share, and subscribe, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care.